for those joining, we're just allowing everybody to get into the webinar. So you'll see it sort of click up in terms of the participants. So just bear with us for a couple of seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, I think I'm gonna kick things off. So uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm Dr. Peter Lynn, I'm a family doctor here in Toronto, uh, Canada. And I'd like to welcome you all to a presentation from Expanding Courses and its uh, online training platform. And today's webinar is getting ready for back to normal. And um, tonight we're gonna have be joined with uh, three excellent guests. We have Dr. Alan Kaplan, we have Dr. Mohit Bhutani, and also Dr. Simon Bacon. So I will introduce them formally. Uh, in a second. We're very pleased to be able to offer this continuing education opportunity in collaboration with the Canadian Thoracic Society. And this is made possible with a non-restrictive educational grant from Moderna. And just a couple of technical aspects before we get started. If you're connecting to the webinar by phone, uh, please note that your phone line will be muted during the whole session. Uh, if you have any questions, we ask that you use the Q&A section uh, that you should find uh, at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. Uh, and the chat function has been disabled just because there's so many people, uh, there'd be too many things whipping back and forth. So please put your questions into the question answer. I'll keep an eye on that uh, because we will have some time and we will intermingle the questions and answers with some of the content that we're going to present as well. Uh, we will do our best to try and answer all questions, uh, but if we don't, then hopefully we will have another seminar for you in the future as well. Uh, please note that this session is recorded, uh, and if we get your email, then there will be email instructions that you can review this, uh, this program in the future as well, if you choose to do so. So just to introduce our excellent uh, panelists, uh, a lot of good friends and, and excellent colleagues in the area of COVID-19, we have Dr. Alan Kaplan. Uh, he's a family physician by his title, but he does so much more. Uh, in the sense that he has chaired the Family Physician Airways Group uh, in Canada. He's the past chairperson of the respiratory section of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. He's a Senate member of the International Primary Care Respiratory Group, and he's co-chaired the community standards of COPD. Basically, anything that has to do with lungs, he has been involved with, along with many other things uh, in primary care. Uh, Dr. Mohit Bhutani, basically he's anything in the respirology world has touched his hands in some fashion. Professor of Medicine at the University of Alberta, Director of Asthma and COPD Clinics, and a member of the Executive of the Alberta Research Center, Alberta Health Services Respiratory uh, Health Strategic Clinical Network uh, since two 2011, and co-chair of the Airways Working Group of the Respiratory Health Strategic Clinical Network. And basically anything that has to do with the lungs uh, he's our specialist and go-to fellow. So with COVID-19, we're very happy to have him on board. And then we have Dr. Simon Bacon, uh, not Kevin Bacon, so he won't dance for us, but he's a professor and, uh, and uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research Strategy for Patient-Oriented uh, Research Chair in the Department of Health, Kinesiology, and Applied Physiology at Concordia University. He is the co-director of the Montreal Behavioral uh, Medicine Center. He's the primary investigator of Eye Care Study, which is an international COVID-19 study, uh, which has over 100,000 responses from people across 150 countries. So we know what's happening through Simon in terms of what people are thinking, what are they feeling, what are their beliefs, etc. So we have him on board to tell us what are all the thoughts that are going on. And that's very useful for us as we move through this. So anything behaviorally related, we turn to Simon. So what we'll do is we'll start off with a couple of slides from me. Uh, I'll sort of set the stage so that we have some data points that we can think about, uh, so that we can think about the efficacy, safety, those kinds of things. And then we're going to get into a bunch of questions. Now, I have a whole set of questions here as well uh, that we've collected from participants from before, patients, uh, other groups and other meetings that we've had. So I have a lot to start with, but please populate the question answer and we'll deal with those uh, as well. Um, so let me just get started here. Uh, let me share my slides. And I'm just going to show you a couple of quick slides, just the original studies, you know, let's just go back to basics. Do these vaccines work, especially the mRNA vaccines where everybody has been talking about. And so let me just show you some of this data. So this is from the mRNA1237. So that's the Moderna vaccine. And I'll show you the Pfizer one shortly. And what we're seeing here is the number of people that get sick uh, over time in the study. And so the gray line represents all the people in the placebo group 
that had the, the placebo shot. And then here is the folks that had the actual vaccine. And these are the number of people that got infected with COVID-19 over time. Now you'll notice that this line is relatively flat and it's very rare that we see that. It's almost like nothing is happening to these people. In other words, they're not getting infected versus the placebo group where you can see that they're increasing. And I think that's why people were quite excited when they saw this information. You guys have all heard about this 94%. Where does that come from? We calculate the difference between these two groups. So it depends on when you calculate. So for example, if I took a snapshot right here, you'll see that the difference between these two groups isn't that much. So maybe about 60% less cases. But if we calculate it at the end of the study right here, you can see that many people on the placebo side have now got infected, but over here, it seems pretty stable. And so when you calculate it here, this is where you're going to get that 94%. So that's why when you hear that at one time point, it's this number and this number, basically it's telling you that more people on the placebo side are getting infected. And that's why the numbers look more and more favorable over time. If you look at the Pfizer BioNTech one, uh, so anytime you see BNT, that's the Pfizer BioNTech one. And so basically it too has this very flat line here and the blue line and the blue dots are the people in the placebo group getting sick uh, over about 112 days or so here as well. So again, if you were to calculate it here, this might be a different number than when you calculate it here, but you could see that these people are very well protected. So these were the two big studies that sort of got people very excited that we could uh, be able to put an end to this particular virus. Now, if you look over here, anytime you see this one, CHAD, that's the chimpanzee adenovirus. So this is referring to the AstraZeneca one. And what you'll see here is that the people that got the injection, it is not a flat line. So therefore these folks are continuing to have some infection, but much less than the placebo group. So these are the people with no vaccines. So that's why even though it's not as powerful, it is much cheaper and it's easier to move around. It doesn't need super cold storages. So that's why many countries are still using this because this kind of protection is still very good for people. Um, and if they can only access this because they can't have a super cooled fridge um, in some of the places, like for example, India, Africa, and things like that, this is much better uh, than no vaccines for these people. What about side effects? And quickly, I won't show you all of them. I'll just show you one. This is the Moderna study. Uh, and the, the way they break it down, it's the same. So for the Pfizer study, it's the same. They look at the first dose and second dose in terms of the side effect. And I think the key learning from this is that the second dose has more side effects. You know, that's, that's just a straightforward, easy way of doing it. This is any adverse event. So any side effect that people reported. And then over here, it'll break it down for you. So when they look at placebo, and the reason why we put placebo in is because you could see here, placebo shot, in other words, not the real vaccine, still has a fair amount of side effects as well. So people react to things. And the red color means a little bit more severe reaction. The gray color is the less severe. So this direction is the things that will bother you a bit more. So what you could see here is that first and second shot, you have the side effects even on the placebo arm. With the real vaccine, you could see these two uh, graphs showing up. So definitely it is higher than the placebo shot. And you'll see that the first shot and the second shot will have more people with the side effects. And it is true, the more severe side effects or the little bit higher grade side effects will be a bit more on the second shot as well. And if you take this as any side effect, if you break it down to fever, headaches, fatigue, so it's very well studied in terms of the side effect, you'll see that same pattern. Placebo group has some and then you see the first shot has some, second shot has a bit more. So that's why oftentimes we'll tell people the second shot, you know, just take it easy. You know, don't push yourself, don't build decks or anything like that, and just rest. And that way there won't be a surprise happening. Um, and so if we understand that, that the second shot is going to have a bit more side effects, then we also understand that we should just take it easy during that time. And so uh, it might be simpler. The good news is that in a third shot situation, most of the people said it wasn't much worse than the first or second shot. So it doesn't seem like the third shot becomes like super more, more side effects or anything like that, uh, that we're seeing with the boostering that we're hearing about. You heard a lot about Israel in terms of their data. And this is the wonderful data that they had looking at 600,000 people that were vaccinated versus 600,000 people unvaccinated here. The vaccinated group is in the blue line and the unvaccinated group is in the red line. And so what you could see here is that there is also that flattening out that happens here. In other words, it's if these people are fairly well protected. 
Um, the good news is that these people were actually older. So these weren't exactly the same groups. These are much older people, sicker people that got the shots. These are the people that did not get the shots yet. So they tend to be younger. So it's very promising that we could protect the elderly as well. Uh, and then this is looking at people that had symptoms. And again, you see this flattening out. This is look at the people that were in the hospital. And again, the vaccinated group did much better. And then this is the severe cases of COVID. And you could see that it flattens out nicely as well. And it's reduced from this position. And then death, thankfully, not too many deaths. These are very small numbers. But you could also see the vaccinated group does very well there. And it was this kind of information that pushed all the governments to say, look, if we do this for our people, um, then we can have the same kind of results that they're having over there. Again, if you measure it here, it'll be different than here. So therefore, whenever you hear about studies that two weeks after the first shot, that may not be enough to see the full benefit of it um, when you're looking at these studies. From this point onward, we won't have nice data like this where half the group didn't get shot and half the group did. Now it's just whoever comes in and is sick, we ask them, did you get a shot or not a shot? So it's not as clean data that we can see over time. Now we're just reporting of the 100 people that came in who had a shot, who didn't have a shot. So it's not as clean data as we had in the original area. Uh, this, uh, just the last two couple of slides, this is actually from the world, uh, our world data. And basically they're looking at as of August 23rd, what's the percentage of people vaccinated? And you'll see Canada was at the top. Okay, so I have a picture of when Canada was at the top. Uh, now, of course, it's not at the top, but it's still pretty high up there. You can see these numbers are quite high. The gray, uh, the light green is people with any shot, so one shot. The dark color is fully vaccinated, so that would be like two shots here. And this number I thought was useful. So there's been 5 billion dosages administered worldwide of COVID vaccines, all types of COVID vaccines. Uh, and right now it's about 33 million shots per day are being administered around the world. So a lot of people were feeling that, you know, this is new. There's only been a few people tested, you know, in the very beginning. And that was true right at the beginning. It was only maybe 30, 40,000 people that have been tested in those studies. Whereas now you could see that many more people have been vaccinated with, the, with this. This one was at the CDC. That's the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. They made this presentation and they were trying to explain why vaccination is a good idea. So they looked at how many people would get disease vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And the blue one is the number of people that would get disease uh, per 100,000 people if you're vaccinated versus the green, which is unvaccinated. And I don't know numbers very well. And that's why they did this, right? They said it's eight times less. So if you get vaccinated, you're eight times less likely um, to pick up the disease. Okay. What about going into hospital? Because people ask me that if I get the vaccine, am I going to go into hospital? And here's the numbers between that. And then they said, this is 25 times less likelihood of going into hospital if you're vaccinated. Uh, and then this one finally is death, because I think everybody worries about that. And again, it's 25 times less likely um, to die if you have the vaccine. Now notice there were people that died who got vaccinated, but you could see this risk reduction is much better. So it's kind of like seatbelts and airbag. So if I have a seatbelt and airbag and I took driver's you know, education, my chance of getting into an accident is much lower. I can still get into an accident, but it's much more reduced. And I think that's the key point that I think the governments and, and the public health were trying to get out. And then finally, just one last slide is just to say the Delta variant is here. 60, 70% of our cases are from there. US, it's more like 90% of the cases are there. It just has a better set of keys. You know, that spike protein has changed so that it's a better set of keys. And it also is, can produce a thousand times more viral particles. So you can spread that much easier. Other people can breathe it in much easier. And then finally, the antibodies are a list sticky to it. So you need more antibodies in order to, to kind of fight off this particular virus. So I think that's why there's a bit of urgency in terms of getting people vaccinated because the Delta variant now is here as well. I will stop sharing there and I'm gonna turn it over to our, our lovely panel. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions, and I see that we have populated questions coming in already. Um, have there been studies? Let, let, me, let me go to the questions, if you guys don't mind, just for a few seconds. Have there been any studies that you can comment on that look beyond 120 days, particular as it might pertain to the need of boosters? Yes. So they're tracking the Israeli population very closely. And what they're noticing for the Pfizer one, at about six months' time, the antibodies are coming down, and the infection rate seems to be ticking upward again. So over there, they've now started vaccinating people with a third shot. Initially, they started with 60-year-olds because they were 
ending up in hospital. And then when they did the shots for them, they cut the hospital rates by about 50%, half of them were gone. And so therefore they've expanded it to 40 year olds, uh, down to 40 year olds in Israel. Here in Canada, we will be doing that for the immunocompromised, the elderly, those kinds of people, um, because they need the most protection. Uh, World Health doesn't want us to do boosters because there's so many countries that they haven't had the first shot yet, okay? Uh, I have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. My first shot was AstraZeneca and my second shot was Pfizer. How protected am I? I think that's a mix and match question. And I think uh, somebody, who was it that was going to uh, take care of that? I think Alan was gonna take care of that. Do you wanna, do you wanna take that one, Alan? So AstraZeneca first, and then uh, now what do we do with the second shot? You know, Because uh, AstraZeneca, we're not gonna be finishing off with AstraZeneca. Um, there was some clot issues there. So uh, Alan, help us out with mix and matching. I'll, I'll just show you that I just made some, vis some visuals all for all of you who are visual learners. I made some visuals on this. And this is a tri trial uh, study from JAMA that answered just that question, JAMA's Journal of American Medical Association. So they did a study and looked at whether someone had uh, um, homogenous or heterologous schedule. So either they had the same or something different. So this is AstraZeneca, first of all. So it showed that, and just as Peter showed, I said it was a little less effective. They showed that AstraZeneca with AstraZeneca did work, but AstraZeneca mixed with Pfizer worked a lot better. So to answer that question, Peter, um, combined stuff do work well. Furthermore, it's also been looked at whether mixing the mRNA viruses, that's a pretty common question now. I had, I had Pfizer, should I get Moderna? Or I had Moderna, should I get Pfizer? And it seems like these are additive to each other as, the, as you add one shot to the other, and they stimulate the immune system very similarly. So I think we get equal efficacy in terms of that. All right, great. Uh, there's just a follow-up question here. Should you get an mRNA shot after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? So that's a, a vector vaccine, so much like the AstraZeneca vaccine, I think, yeah? And I think that would be uh, that would be something. Now, Johnson & Johnson here in Canada, we don't have that really available for people. We had a shipment, but apparently it wasn't well-made or the factory wasn't well-made. So therefore, Canada said, look, we're going to hold off. We don't want to, to, to cause any confusion here. So we don't really have Johnson & Johnson here. Uh, but for the folks in the U.S., there were states that have been using an mRNA afterwards. Uh, and then Johnson & Johnson just released their second dose six months later and they showed that they can boost up antibodies so we'll see what the u.s sort of does whether they follow johnson and johnson two of them or whether they follow johnson and johnson and mrna but thankfully here in canada uh, we don't have to make that decision uh, quite just yet okay, Peter, just, yes, to go go that, just to go to that last uh question regarding pulmonary fibrosis so yes. know, i think the patient that that asked that or the person that asked that question you know, I think I think Alan's answered the question regarding the the vaccine there, but I think at the end of the day, you know, you got an underlying lung condition, and you know, I think some of the the public health measures that are being lifted, you know, I sort of advocate to all of my patients with underlying lung disease to continue to sort of uh, follow the you know the, what we were doing in the months previous, uh, simply because of the fact of the you know the, the disease that you have will lend itself to potentially more severe illness, and so um, get the vaccine, yes, as you've done. But continue to follow the public health and continue to you know you know use your masks and, and try to follow you know what you were doing pre some of the lifting that's going on to give yourself the maximum protection. Right, that that's a good point, right? In other words, the vaccine, if you think about it, that's your last layer of protection. So that means everything else has failed and the virus is in your house, <laughs> and then you need your um, security system to work, right? So. Ideally, we would still keep the distance, keep the virus away from your house. It's kind of like pre protecting the president or, well, actually we don't want to protect the president anymore, but <laughs> protecting the, the, something that you love. Um, so you keep the distance and then you do the mask and you know, all those layers as well. Um, here's one that's popped up. Um, should I be letting non-vaccinated people in my house? Some of our friends are not vaccinated. I'm concerned about how safe it is. This is a big concern. So Simon, what do we do about that? You know, like there, there's people vaccinated, unvaccinated, we yeah. want to be able to mingle, but we don't want to offend people. <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. So I, that, that's great. And first of all, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we've got a great turnout here and um, uh, it's wonderful to be part of this panel. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, some of the data that, that's out there, because uh, I think that that's kind of an important situator to start with. And then a little bit about what, what can you do in those scenarios? So. I think part of this issue is always about uh, what kind of risk are we talking about and what kind of concerns might you have? 
So um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm going to pull upon a study that was just published a few days ago um, in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine. And so this is a large uh, study where they looked at a, a bunch of people. It's actually from China and it looked at people being infected and when they were infected and, and close contacts and what happened with their close contacts. And so what we have here is um, this is an individual. So if you can imagine the whole series of individuals at the bottom here uh, and, and when they had contact with people and when pe those contacts got sick. And so what I'm going to show you here is this window, which is the really important window. So what's in, in orange here is, is the time window where anyone they came in contact with got sick. What the zero indicates is, is the, the day before they had symptoms. Okay, so these are all symptomatic individuals. And so what you see, um, which is kind of interesting is, you know, two to three days before they had symptoms, they were infecting close contacts. So one of the problems always is, um, if someone's unvaccinated, obviously we know their risk of, of, of having COVID is much, much higher. And the problem is if you let them into your house, it's, just, it's possible that they have it and they could infect you but they don't have any symptoms at that point in time. So this is one thing that I just want to flag because this is, you know, it, it, the question of risk is quite important. Um, another thing just, uh, and then it went out to about three days afterwards. The blue bars, just very briefly, just to show you, these blue bars was the, uh, the, the average number of contacts. And you can see that this, this is risk and the risk is, is pretty steady, independent of how much contact they had. So you can come into contact with, with fewer people or a lot of people, doesn't really matter. The, the risk of catching is still quite high. Um, another couple of things just around this um, was also how sick was, was the individual. So when you compare them to um, you know, someone, someone that didn't have any symptoms, whether, the, whether the, the person who had the COVID had mild or moderate symptoms had very little impact on whether the other person got it. So um, you know, how sick someone ends up being is not a good indicator of how likely you are to get it. And if we look at settings, which I think is also a key, key part of this question here. So um, when they look to, you know, sometimes very rarely people sort of pick up COVID in very random settings. It's very hard to actually trace. They weren't in very, you know, long contact with someone. Um, so they use that as the sort of base to compare against. When they compared against that, what they found was, which is a good sign, you're about 60% less likely to catch COVID if you're in a healthcare setting. So healthcare settings are really, really safe settings. I think that's a really important thing to highlight here. Um, if you had a known close contact, so you were in a car with someone, you were in a room having a conversation with someone, even if it was 15 minutes, you're about six times more likely to get it. But more importantly, if you had that person in your household, you were eight times more likely to get it. So you have this scenario where if someone's unvaccinated, they have a higher probability, a higher probability of getting COVID. Um, it's possible that they can come to your house and not be sick and still pass on COVID to you. And they can, um, you know, and that's the highest risk setting. A household's the highest risk setting. So that's your risk. Now, obviously, as, as Peter highlighted, it's not always that straightforward to, um, you know, have that conversation with people. So I think one of the things that, that's always really important is um, to be open and honest uh, about where your position is, your concerns, um, sort of identify why you want to be as safe as possible. Most of us have sort of good reasons. There's normally someone that um, we're worried about who we care for or, um, you know, our own personal situation and so on. And I think the issue is, is trying to then find scenarios where um, hopefully if they're good friends of yours or if they're family members, you can have that open conversation with them and, and they will be understanding. Um, an alternate to meeting in a house is obviously trying to find a, a venue and a scenario where there's less la la chance of exposure, so outdoors. Um, if you are vaccinated and you're wearing a mask and you're outdoors and, and they're not vaccinated and they're not wearing a mask, your chance of uh, catching COVID from them is, is significantly reduced, especially if you can keep distance from them. So, you know, 
things like this and sort of your concerns about your potential risk is important, but, but those open and honest conversations are critical to have with them. And don't be afraid to do that because this is obviously your health. This is, um, you know, this is, is important for you. Uh, and if they're good friends and family, they'll respect that. Yeah, and I noticed a few people have done this. They go, I'm not comfortable with this scenario. Like, in other words, it's not that I need you to do whatever. It's just, I'm not comfortable with it. And, and I noticed that people kind of respect that nowadays, you know? So, yeah. so I, I've noticed that with masks and things like that. If people say, I'm not comfortable with this, then, you know, so it's not that you're saying, you know, the science better or whatever, but it's basically, you're not comfortable with it. And I, and I think that seems to hold well, but thank you for that. Cause I think a lot of people have hit that scenario uh, recently, especially when people are trying to get together. Uh, here's a question. Okay. I heard vaccines may lose their efficacy. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Sorry, quick comment. I think that issue about healthcare setting about being a not significant increased risk is really important. Many of, uh, of you out there have not gone to the doctor for a long time. You're afraid to get help. You're afraid to go to the emergency room if you're unwell because you're afraid of getting COVID. Uh, please, in the healthcare settings, we're ridiculously careful. We're wearing PPE and extra special masks and washing our hands 50,000 times a day, we're being very, very cautious to look after you. So if you need healthcare, please don't avoid it because of your fear of COVID. Back to you, Pete. Yeah, that's a good point because people were ignoring chest pain. They were ignoring a whole lot of things. So please don't ignore things. It is safe. I know in the beginning we said, don't come to the hospital, but that was back then. So now we have lots of good uh, process that's in, in place. Uh, here's a question about loss of efficacy after six months. So effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, what about uh, boosters? So what, uh, what about boostering? Al Alan, you have some information on boostering, yeah? Yes. So um, you mentioned this already, Peter, that it's now being done routinely in Israel. It's being advocated in the United States. Uh, to be fair, Health Canada has not made this decision. Uh, but one thing I'd, I'd just like to quickly say is the terminology of this. I think calling it a booster you know, you know, raises hackles for some people. I think we need to call this the third dose. And as we learn more about this, we learn that actually we're going to require more doses to get adequately vaccinated. So think about this as likely something that's just going to be our new reality, or we're going to need another dose. The other issue is, of course, some people need it more than others. And I think a young, healthy person's immune system is going to be perhaps strong enough for the immunity to last longer. But the government, uh, the Ministry of Health, has announced that COVID vaccina vaccination as a third dose will be offered uh, no sooner than eight weeks after the second dose in vulnerable populations. So who are those? It's all about the immune system. If you had a transplant, which means you're on immunosuppressive agents, if you had a cancer and you're on chemotherapy, if you're on some kind of a biologic that affects your immune system, um, all, of, all of that list of people have a problem with your immune system and therefore they may not have created enough response from the first two doses. And I know there's been a big study done in Canada at down Toronto General that looked at people who are on transplants and they got second doses and they measured the antibodies. They're getting a third dose and the third dose seems to be quite effective in getting a good measurable effective antibody dose. So I think we're going to see this in your compromise. In addition, uh, they're, being, they're being offered to high-risk congregate settings, which include long-term care homes, high-risk retirement homes, and First Nations elder care, and looking at about uh, five months following the second dose. So I think our booster or our third dose is going to be important, certainly for the people at highest risk. And in time, depending on the politics of it, I think we're going to see this in everybody uh, being offered at some point. Okay, so... Boosters are going to be around for a bit and there might be different versions of it, you know, like 2.0, it'll be like the iPhone, you'll have different versions that will cover different things. So I think this will be a good thing that they can keep on top of it. Um, as the virus tries to change, we will change and adapt with it as well. Uh, here's a question. I have breast cancer and got treatment with chemotherapy. How long is my immune system considered compromised? That's a good question because chemotherapy, you take it and, and Mohit, there's many patients that are taking biologics that are stopping some disease process, you know, these injections that stop the immune system from going crazy. Um, wh what do we tell them, like, in, in terms of their, are they always just immunocompromised and we treat them as such? Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> there's many perspectives on that, depending on what type of therapy you're getting for what condition, I think it's going to be variable. So not knowing this particular person's chemotherapeutic regimen offhand, um, you know, I think there is immune reconstitution over time and, and, um, and, you know, your immune system will, 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 will help be helpful. But I think all the societies 
of all chronic illnesses, rheumatological disease, asthma, uh, you know, in, you know in, 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 inflammatory bowel disease, everyone's recommending getting the vaccine independent of, of, um, of your underlying condition to provide you that with that uh, protection. How, how quickly your immune system will recover will be, will be you know, dependent on what type of uh, treatment you've had thus far. Right. And it makes sense though. So still get the vaccine and then do those layers of protection that you mentioned, right? In other words, mask and distance and all of those things. Um, so that's why I think, I think it's important for people to remember that, that not everybody will generate all those antibodies. And so let's just be on the safe side and put those layers of protection as well. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Simon, go ahead. Just, I mean, I think another point that's really uh, probably important here as well is that there's, there's no downside to getting, um, the vaccine or a booster in those people that are immunocompromised, right? I mean, I think there are some people I've heard, you know, say, well, I am immunocompromised. I'm worried if I get this, it's going to make me sick or it's going to, I'm going to have a negative effect because of that. And I think it's really important to highlight that that's really not a, a not an issue in any way, shape or form. And in fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's very important that you get those because they will be very helpful and, and protect you. But right, I think right. the, the point we just talked about in regards to having the booster, you know, I think that's something you need to talk to your, the provider of your therapy, if it's chemotherapeutics, you know, uh, you know, are you eligible when you're eligible and, and, you know, whether you should go for it. I think that's really critical uh, uh, going along because I think we're realizing that the immune response and in, in patients who do have chemotherapeutics immune compromised from drugs due to transplant don't garner the same uh, immune response that we look for. And the booster will be really critical to helping them, you know, provide them with that extra layer of protection. Good. And just before we go on to the next question, I just want to remind people that if you order a blood test for the antibodies, it's not the right antibody for the shot. Okay. It's an antibody against the virus. So it'll tell you whether you were infected or not, but it will not tell you whether the vaccine worked or not, unfortunately. So we don't, don't, don't go and try and find the antibody test for that and don't order it on the internet because you don't know who's sending you what I could be sending it to from my basement or something. Uh, so the next question, very, very important. School is about to start and parents are freaking out. Uh, we've got, you know, under 12 is not vaccinated. Some schools, mass, no mass, some below age of five, no mass. It's just all over the place. And then now we introduce this Delta and we've seen it in the US that the pediatrics, the kiddie population is very much infected down there. Um, so how likely... Is it the Delta virus that's going to cause trouble? What should we do for our kids? Like, is there any advice? Because they can't get the vaccine. What, what do we do around children and how do we alleviate that? Who wants to take a stab at that one? <laughs> Everybody's smiling. Well, anyway, uh, okay, go well, ahead. It's a very complicated You got question. kids, you got kids. So. Well, that's exactly it. Yeah, so as, as a parent to kids that have not vaccine eligible, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking. I'm, 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 I'm like everyone else where we're trying to make the best decisions for, you know, what's right for, for our family. But I think two things, one, I think, you know, the vaccinations uh, rates are, are compared to the United States, we're a lot better in a better situation than we're than the United States So that we have that level of protection. And I think if you look across country, I think most school boards are moving towards a mass mandate for K to 12 or four to 12 uh, for, for that population. So having, you know, teachers mass, uh, students masks and, um, and I think we're trying I think that's the right way to go and if you look at the individual states in the United States where you know COVID Delta variants going you know crazy uh, it's it is you know low vaccination rates along with the mask mandate that's been lifted and I think we're being a little bit more sensible when it comes to that within Canada so I think I'm hopeful that that'll be um, that that'll be uh, helpful for us but I think good public health measures contact tracing uh, testing, those kinds of things still need to be implemented and, and need to be part of day-to-day -day life for the, for the short term, because we are just heading into this fourth wave and Delta variant is now gotten a hold. So I think we, you know, get more vaccinations in, keep on doing the masking within the school systems, and then also being, you know, very thoughtful and mindful with the contact tracing and, and, and making sure we notify people when they're at risk. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Alan, go the ahead. Good news, yeah, well, the good news is that uh, pediatric COVID for the most part is not as severe. But as Mohit said, no, it doesn't mean you're off the hook. And there's been significant cases in the southern United States. Uh, the, the, the perfect storm of being unvaccinated and, and grouping together uh, caused that. Uh, just to be a little bit political here, um, you know, we, you know, mandatory uh, vaccines and vaccine passports and so on um, is happening in the government. It's happening in healthcare. Um, shouldn't it be happening in teachers? 
And I'd like to think that Mohi, when your kids go to school, their teacher at least has been vaccinated, which will decrease the risk of those kids. My kids are older, so I don't have to make this really tough decision that some of you do. And it'll be a very independent decision you're going to make between the risk of COVID and the risk to your family versus the social costs of children not going to school and getting together with other kids and learning how to play. Uh, there's some real issues on both sides of this, and uh, I don't think we have a perfect answer. So each of you have to look at this question individually. But I sure would like to know that my teacher of my child is vaccinated. I'll just I'll get off the political bandwagon there. Yeah, Simon, go ahead. Okay, so now that his political platform has been set, okay, Simon, you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think there's a, a couple of things that uh, that I'll, I'll add to this. Um, the, the question about the contagiousness of um, Delta. I mean, that, I think that's a really interesting one. And and um, someone explained it to me in a, in a really interesting way. So um, with the original Wuhan virus, uh, the estimate was if you came home um, and you had a household of four other people, you were likely to infect one other person in that household. So it's about 25% of the people that, that would be in the household. In comparison, the Delta virus, if you had the Delta virus and you came home and there's four other people in that household, the probability is you'd infect all four of them. So just to give you an example that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, scaremonger here or anything, but there is a significant increase in the, the transmissibility and, and the infectiousness of um, the Delta virus. So we do have to be cautious. That being said, there's some really nice data that's just coming out of the US because they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of schools going back. And what's nice is they have a great deal of variability in terms of mandates and, and proces pro procedures and so on. That's really showing... Um, some data came out of Georgia showing that in those schools that had mass mandates, there was a 40% reduction in, in cases. And in those schools that had mass mandates and good ventilation, it was about an 80% reduction uh, in uh, cases. So I think there is some of these things which are really on a personal level, um, wearing masks is, is obviously key, but then also putting pressure on the schools to make sure that they've got the right kind of ventilation and, and keep pushing them on that um, becomes important things. I, I too have a, a child who's just above and just below uh, those cutoffs, so having to deal with those kind of issues. And, and we've been quite vocal in, in speaking to the school about some of these things, and the schools have been very responsive. Um, all right. That's a good point. In other words, schools can do something about it. Your kids can do something about it. So I, I, I often tell people, you know, the, the vaccine is like a goalie. So you have a goalie that defends you in here, which is very good. Your mask is like a defenseman, you know, to keep, keep the virus away from your goalie. And then you have the forward guys, you know, the forwards that are deep in the other end zone, kind of keeping the puck over there. Those are, that's your distance and ventilation. And the children can't control ventilation, but they can certainly control distance. So a little bit of distance away, keep the mask on. Um, at lunchtime is the worst where everybody's mask is off. So we need bigger distance between people if their masks are off and try not to face people. I, I've been telling kids to, you know, be antisocial and turn the other way, <laughs> or at least be on an angle. So that way you can't breathe air. And just remember the virus cannot move on its own. It has no wings or feet. It actually has to be propelled by a person blowing it out. And then the other person has to suck it in. Like that's how the mechanics work. So that's why masks will be helpful. A face shield for the teacher is helpful if they need to get close to the child, because on top of the mask, you have a face shield, a piece of plastic that stops that airflow as well. Um, so those are important things. And on a school bus, I know a lot of parents are worried about school buses. Um, have the kids sit together with the same friends. So that's kind of like you're bubbling windows down if you can, and then have masks on. And I know this sounds terrible, but no talking or screaming. And that has less virus moving around as well. So those are things that you, you can do because we don't have the vaccine for them. All the companies are working frantically to, to finish their studies, but you know the governments obviously want longer safety data, right? Two months isn't enough, they want six months. You know, So that's why there's a delay um, because they want more safety because it's about our children and things like that. So those things will come, but not for next week or the week after where we're starting, but at least teach your kids. And I've told my kids, uh, the young nephews that I have, you know, hold your breath when you're walking past somebody. Cause somebody said, well, what happens if I come out of the washroom and there's somebody right there? Then I said, just pretend they're smoking. You hold your breath and you walk past them and you're not sucking in the virus. So that that's very empowering if we sort of give them those kinds of things uh, as well. Um, here's a good question. I've heard that some people get COVID and then they stay sick for a very long time. And we've all seen those as physicians. Um, so long COVID, because I think the problem is everybody thinks I get COVID, I get better, no big deal. 
Um, so thoughts on long COVID in terms of, have you seen it? Does it hit anybody? Do you have to be very sick in a hospital to get long COVID or can normal people get long COVID? What, what have you guys been seeing out there? So Mohit, maybe you start. Alan. I'll, I'll start. Oh, okay, Alan, I'll go start. ahead. Go ahead, Alan. Unless you want to, Mo. Um, so long COVID is a constellation of many different symptoms that uh, that can all be all many different organ systems can be affected by COVID. It's certainly much more common in people who are sicker with COVID, but unfortunately, can also occur in people who had moderate disease. The, the issues can be respiratory, like in the lung. I'll let Mohit talk about that. Uh, but they can also be psychiatric. Uh, and that's not doesn't mean it's just having trouble adjusting to being sick. There's real phenomena change, neurologic, uh, uh, vascular in the in the lungs, like blood clots and things like that. So depending on what illness you've had, how much you'll suffer from it can make a difference. But there's been studies looking at a variety of things to treat long COVID, from using antidepressants, uh, one called Zoloft that actually was was reasonably effective in a couple of studies. So we're just now learning what to do with long COVID much like we're now learning how to treat COVID, which we didn't know, have any idea what to do initially. And we subsequently tried a lot of things. Don't use chloroquine, that's a different conversation, but okay. And now we're learning these things. So we're learning about long COVID as well. And I think there will be some more specific treatments coming in the next little while. But right now, it's just looking after people the best we can with the illnesses they have from the COVID. The nice thing is uh, I just read an article that talked about most of the people who even had bad lung COVID um, have recovered for the most part. So some of them, of course, will not, but most have. So I think if we look at time being the big, big issue, it's going to allow most of us to recover over time, but we have to be supported through that time of recovery. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, I'll just add to that. So from a, a pulmonary perspective, it, there's there's always, um, I, I group them into two separate categories. So one, I'll talk about the hospitalized patient that comes in who develops underlying sort of structural lung disease, secondary to the inflammation that, that COVID generates within the lungs. Some of those patients do recover over weeks to months back to normal as, um, as Alan has just uh, uh, described, but there are a cohort of patients who are left with underlying structural lung disease, fibrotic lung disease that, uh, that they will be left with and essentially be handicapped uh, sort of going forward. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out right now at the Canadian Thoracic Society how to best rehab these patients to help them get the best, uh, you know, outcomes over the long term. And, and unfortunately, right now, the literature is kind of all over the place. And we're going to put together a position statement in that, in that regard, help clinicians across the country develop programs to help these patients that suffer from, uh, you know, structural changes due to, to, due to COVID. The second group are patients who have milder disease or moderate disease who, despite not requiring hospitalization, have persistent dyspnea, shortness of breath that just lasts. And I've had a number of patients who, you know, who, for a wide demographic of, of people, including elite athletes who had mild COVID symptoms, but who have never just kind of gotten back to that higher level of of, of functioning that they actually had. And, and so it's interesting, there's colleagues of mine at the University of Alberta that run a COVID clinic. And, and what we're doing here is we're actually taking some of these patients who come in with persistent dyspnea, have normal x-rays, who have normal lung function, and we're actually doing cardiopulmonary exercise tests on them. And it's interesting to see from the early data is that those, these patients actually have normal cardiac pulmonary responses to exercise. So they're getting, they're, they're, they're still having persistent dyspnea, but it's, it's not due to cardiac or lung dysfunction per se, it's more of a deconditioned sort of situation. And so now we're sort of thinking, well, is it is a muscle issues, is it, is it an uptake at the, at the muscular level in terms of the way that the body extracts oxygen or, or what, what, what else is there? So early data would suggest these patients with normal lung function, normal imaging, who have persistent, persistent dyspnea, have a normal cardiac pulmonary uh, response. So again, to Alan's point, there's it's early days, lots of research that needs to be done. Uh, Canadian Institute for Health Research has just given out a lot of money to help uh, researchers across the country sort of answer some of these questions. So we're very much in early days in terms of answering some of this stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, in UK, they've got some studies looking at the mitochondria. So it turns out our little power plant that makes energy for us, it uses two fuel sources. It uses sugar kind of and fat. And it turns out we use a mixture of it uh, normally. So sugar gives you fast energy and then the fat gives you long-term energy. And it turns out the virus comes in and flips your energy use. It switches it all to like the sugar energy, fast energy. So that way you can build lots of virus particles. Unfortunately, when the virus leaves in some people, it doesn't flip back. So it's stuck in that position. So it gives you fast energy, but you can't last. So therefore a lot of people, I saw one question about what about training and all that stuff. 
So people that were elite athletes that were healthy can get long COVID and they cannot just go back and just say, I'm just going to work through it. They just get very exhausted. It's almost like, you know, your cell phone battery doesn't last as long and you just drain out. Um, so the best thing, if there's anybody that you know, is to go very slowly and build back up. And what we're trying to do is encourage that mitochondria to switch over. Another thing that they've been looking at in the UK is they've been vaccinating people uh, to see whether they would have lots of problems if they have this long COVID and we had to give them a vaccine to protect them. Would they have bad side effects from it? And strangely, about a quarter of them got better. Um, so you might have seen an article that popped up that says, you know, vaccination fixes this thing. It doesn't fix it for everybody. But I think by giving the vaccine, you sort of tell the immune system, okay, focus on this. You don't have to attack everything. Just focus on this and everything is good. So um, they're doing more studies in terms of can vaccination be another way, although we don't have enough vaccines to go around. Sorry, Simon, you were going to yeah. say something. No, no, that's okay. Because there was just one other piece about this long COVID, which, um, and, and I think it's one of those issues where, you know, it's, it's a new phenomenon. We're still learning lots. So um, I, I, what I will say up front to everyone is, is what we say now may change in the very near future because because there's lots of research going on and, and and lots of things we're learning so that's one thing the other thing i will say there is also another uh, cluster of long covid as well which is these people that got covid they had some symptoms symptoms went away and then 10 to 12 weeks later they have a re-emergence of symptoms um so the, so what i want to say is just you know if you know someone that has that or you've had that experience um, it's not necessarily that you've got COVID again, but it could be this long COVID and it could be, it's a real phenomenon. It's not, um, you know, just something that you think is going on. It, it could well be happening. And I think uh, as Mohi um, mentioned, you know, there are a lot of really good clinics. Now I think most cities across Canada now have, have long COVID clinics. Um, so there's resources that are out there. And, and if you think that you might have long COVID reach out and contact a clinic in your um, in your city uh, because it, it it does need treating it does need following um, and and it it needs to be um, you know uh, explored uh, with with, uh, with the healthcare team and on average the studies when they look at long covid people just for audience um, on average it's 16 symptoms that they have it's not one or two it's multiple organ systems that they have difficulty with and and that's another reason why this idea of just let everybody get covid uh, and then everybody would have immunity and things like that doesn't make sense because about 10 percent of the people will go on to this long covid so right now in Canada, I think we're at 100 and uh, or 1.5 million or whatever. Anyway, so we have about 150,000 people in that category, potentially of 10% roughly. Um, that's what they're seeing. Here's a very important question. My 19 year old son does not think he needs to get a vaccination because um, he might get sick from the vaccine, uh, but he won't get sick from the COVID because he's young and healthy. So therefore, there's no need for the vaccine. And, and, uh, and it says that my, myself and my husband, these are the parents that are now saying like, what do we do? Like, how do we, <laughs> Simon, what do we, you're the behavioral guy, Mohit. Okay, Mohit, you go first. And then we'll let the, oh, and let, then let Alan's Simon, oh, everybody's lighting up now. Okay. So let's Mohit, you, you, you've got experience here, it sounds like, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it's just interesting. You know, everyone's perspective is going to be different and, 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 and we're going to inundate you with, with, with facts, but it, it honestly, as a, as a, as a healthcare provider, uh, the hospitals now are littered with younger folks who are now developing the consequences of, 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 um, of COVID. And it's really disheartening. You know, it, it really is seeing that these, these people who now sit back and they reflect back and they go, my God, why didn't I listen? And, and there's, a, there's a lot of perspective on, on, on this. And as a provider right now, uh, all I can say is that um, to your son is that that's who I'm taking care of. When I'm on hospital duty, it's younger, unvaccinated folks, and um, it's real. You know, it's gone from the older folks uh, with multiple comorbidities in the, in the wave one to the point now young, healthy folks that are now, you know, developing this disease. And, it, and, and not just in Canada, in, in my area of, the, uh, of Canada, but you just look at the, what's happening from reports in the United States and, um, you know, and, and, and the, what's being set out, what's been, you know, told in the news and, and on media, um, it's real. And I can just tell you, I was on call last week and, and that's what I was taking care of. And, and, it, and it's sad as a, cl as a clinician because you're taking these young people of you know, great futures and, and now they're going to have an altered course. So I'll pause there and let uh, Simon give you the, the yeah. real. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that, I think that's the reality um, that we're seeing, but, but obviously one of the, one of the issues here is, is from the very beginning of the pandemic, there was, you know, a, a, all the rhetoric was around older individuals. So we kind of 
shot ourselves in a little bit of, in the foot a little bit here with this because a lot of young people just feel like this is not something that's important to them. So, so the first thing I say is you really have to understand where, you know, younger individuals are coming from. The other thing that's always really important is, is younger individuals feel invincible. So any kind of conversation around health um, is always a bit tricky because they always think it's this thing that's way off in the future. It's nothing they have to worry about and so on. So um, the thing probably not to do is start coming at this from the health perspective. And I think where you probably want to shift the conversation is really around asking them, um, you know, what do they see as the advantages of being vaccinated? And of course, now with the introduction of things like vaccine passports and the things that people will be able to do if they're vaccinated, you know, thinking about those things. And then what are the costs of not getting vaccinated? And some of that will play into the same thing, but they're also as well, you know, things about their capacity to socialize. And if they don't get vaccinated, then they won't be able to hang out with their friends as easily. Um, etc. So I think some of those things become really important and, and asking them to generate the good excuses and good reasons why they would go out and get vaccinated um, and sort of making them say, well, you know, not getting vaccinated is going to cost me this, this and this, and then just reinforcing those within them um, and then respecting their decision around that process um, becomes really important. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's that's a really key thing. You know, adolescents like their autonomy and you have to respect that autonomy if you want to to help facilitate them down a certain path. I think that passport into the bar, I think that would that would do it. <laughs> I think in, in Ireland, apparently, it, like vaccination uptake when when they said you can't go to a pub unless you have the vaccines and it went up. Alan, you had a comment. Sorry. My, my quick Cavalier uh, comment was going to be behind you. You've got the, the dome there, so they can't go to a Blue Jay game. But more importantly than that, I think, Simon, I'm going to un unshoot us in the foot and recognize that the virus has changed. We went mm -hmm. from the first virus, which really didn't affect younger people very much, uh, to now a Delta virus. And I think the difference has got to do with transmissibility. As Peter said at the beginning, it's 12, 1,500 times more virus created. And you put a bunch of young people together, as they tend to do, and I understand it. Once, once, once a long time ago, I was young as well. And uh, they're going to then infect each other. So it's the amount of virus that these young people are going to have exposure to and spread amongst themselves that puts them at risk. So it has changed. I think that's part of the answer. Yes, when we started, it was older people. Uh, but now it actually is a real thing to affect you. And don't be, and don't be cavalier about it. Yeah, that's a good point, because with more viruses coming out of my face, you're going to breathe it in, you know, like uh, there's going to be more viruses coming to you. Another thing that we could explain to them, perhaps, is that um, the way the virus does damage, let me just borrow two minutes of your time right now. The way the virus does damage, it does not produce a toxin. It doesn't have any toxins or anything like that. The way it does damage is when it triggers your own cells to kill itself. So we have an auto destruct sequence in our cells. So when the cell is very badly damaged or it's infected, it will kill itself to protect the rest of the organism. And so with the first version of the virus, what happened was that elderly people had damage in their cells. They had cancer, they had diabetes, they had heart attack. So they already had a, a high level of damage in their cells being old and all these diseases. So it doesn't take much for the virus to push them over and then they trigger that auto destruct sequence. And so that's why the first pass, it was elderly. They just need a little virus on top. It pushes them over the edge. They cause the auto destruct. They destroy their own lung cells. And that's why they got into trouble. The new Delta one, because it can generate so many viral particles within each cell, it can generate a thousand times more. So let's say the old virus can produce a thousand particles. This one can produce now a million particles in the cell. So you don't need any damage in the cell. You have enough viruses to trigger the auto-destruct sequence. And so that's why young, healthy people are ending up, as, as Mohit was saying, because once the virus gets in, it's going to go into all the cells and it's going to make a million copies inside the cell. It triggers the auto-destruct, your cells destroy itself, and then your lungs are destroyed. And that's why we're seeing, you know, 20-year-olds with bad lungs lying there can't breathe. And so if we just explain that to people, that as Alan put it, this virus is different, it, it can now trigger that destructive force uh, without needing any other pre-existing diseases. And that's why I'm in trouble. The good news though, is that remember we vaccinated all the elderly 
and we don't hear a lot of you know nursing homes getting into all sorts of trouble anymore and so on and so forth so it means that the vaccine is very good at doing that it stops the virus from coming in and then making millions of copies and so maybe that might be something uh, of some use. We have a lot of questions about masking because it sounds like masking is going to be part of our future. Vaccinated, not vaccinated, we have to put on the mask because we could pick up the virus and things like that. So a lot of questions about masking. So a couple of things, um, how, how often should we change the mask? Should we use double mask? Should we use N95, normal mask? And uh, should we use cloth mask? And should we? what should we do? So some thoughts about masking in general. Um, may be useful because it sounds like we're going to continue on with this. Okay, go ahead. Uh, who would like to take that one on? Maybe I'm Simon, got, Simon, go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple of slides because one of, one of the things that, that uh, I get asked quite often is well, how good are masks? Um, and, and we talk about, you know, they're, they're great, but, but what's the evidence that supports that? So I just got a few things. So um, CDC has done a phenomenal job of being able to really vulgarize a lot of what they're showing. Um, and so I've got a couple of scenarios that they managed to track in terms of a scenario with no mask and a scenario with masks. So um, this was something they um, published recently. Uh, this was a choir who um, were uh, practicing. Um, and uh, there's about 50 or so people in this choir. And during this one practice, no one wore masks. So no one is masked and you had one symptomatic case. Someone what just one person got sick. And so they managed to do the contact tracing to come back to this. That one person managed to infect 32 confirmed cases and 20 probable cases. It was just one practice that they could drew this back to. No masking whatsoever. I contrast that with this other study, which they showed they had two hairstylists who tested positive and they treated 139 people and they were in contact with each of these individuals for over 15 minutes. Everyone was wearing masks. None of the 139 got sick. So just really two powerful examples of where you're not masking, you got mass spread and masking really, really sort of stops the spread. And then just one other very brief slide I just wanna show you here. So this is data that just from um, October I won't talk about the political colors between the, the blue and the red, but the point to see here is on the bottom is the, the percentage of each state who report wearing masks most of the time. And on the left uh, is the average number of cases. And you can see this very nice line where the states that report um, more mask wearing have lower rates. And just to, to Finally, this was another study where they actually managed to track um, face mask use, uh, sorry, the introduction of um, uh, face mask policies in, in, and I forget which population, I apologize. Um, and what you see is, is to the left-hand side of the dotted line, pretty constant uh, amount of uh, um, COVID. They introduced face mask uh, mandate and almost a linear drop in um, cases. So, you know, masks really are very effective and an incredibly important tool, along with the, the other elements that we have there. So I, I just wanted to put that out there to start with, just so that um, to really reinforce the idea that masks are important. That's awesome. I, though, you, you have the best slides ever. Anyway, <laughs> um, other thoughts from Alan and Mohit about masks and things like that? I or totally agree. <laughs> And I 100% agree, uh, but you asked some other questions about which masks and how many masks and cloth yes. versus paper. And I think it's been shown that cloth are not quite as effective. And uh, that's one thing. So maybe you wear a paper underneath your fancy, colorful, uh, uh, well-designed cloth masks for fashion. The other issue is N95 masks, and a lot of people have used those. Um, if you use an N95 mask properly, and I, I treated people with the first SARS COVID virus, you know, in sick people, that was a bit of a different virus because the sicker you were, the more virus you 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 you, you, you coughed up. And uh, wearing an N95 mask for more than a couple hours is actually very difficult. So if you're wearing an N95 mask all day, you're probably not wearing it right because it actually seals everything so much that you actually get a re your absorption of, the, of your carbon dioxide. It makes you dizzy. So I think N95 is probably more than you need, unless you're in a healthcare setting where you're treating people who are sick and therefore 
excreting a lot of virus. So wear a mask. Probably wearing any mask is better than no mask. And if you're more concerned, wear two masks. No problem, no harm. Uh, but I probably wouldn't bother with an N95. Just to add that N95, right? That one needs to be specially fitted uh, to your face uh, and requires you to have it retested every six months and it's not readily available. But, um, you know, uh, I think the mask, uh, the, the, the Canadian Public Health Agency sort of suggested, like you said, have a dual, at least a dual layered mask, uh, you know, your cloth mask that you, the fashion one, and then have something behind there to help um, help filter out the virus uh, as best as possible. But, um, you know, it, it's a thorny issue when it comes to masks. I mean, you saw the evidence there that Simon has, uh, has uh, proposed. I live in a province and uh, where the mask mandate was lifted very early, and um, and as you, you can see by just the numbers of what's happening within this province, that uh, maybe that was not the best decision to be have had and have made. And um, we're going now into winter. We're going to be more indoors. We're going to be more closer to each other. So some of the proximities uh, that that you know maybe protected us in the summertime, uh, we're going to be lost. And so I think it is as critical as anything else that, that we can do to continue um, doing this because the virus is going to continue to mutate. I mean, it's going to continue to sort of evolve a little bit. And until we get vaccination rates to where they are, until booster shots come into play um, or routine vaccination becomes the norm, um, I think the masks are critical. And, and, and it, the evidence is just so clear uh, as to how important it actually is. So. Um, wear something and uh, but yeah n95 just to just to close on that comment uh, it, you know it's formally fitted it needs to be refitted every six months and not readily available all right that's good Go ahead, it's probably worth adding, probably worth adding to that peter is the concept of mutation which we've touched upon to recognize in order for the virus to mutate there has to be a lot of it around which means there has to be lots of sick people the virus is a smart they're all smarter than a virus but the virus wants to live so therefore, each mutation, if it's advantageous to the virus to become more infective or more destructive, it will actually mutate and then be successful. That's why the Delta virus has taken over because it's so much more virus gets created per single virus. So then the next mutation may be worse. Next mutation that, that goes out and, and, and exists and continues. And the only way we can prevent mutations is by preventing infection. So once again, that's part of the discussion about why we all need to be vaccinated because the next one, and again, fear mongering, as Simon said, is not what I'm trying to do, but the reality of this is that the only way we can prevent further deadlier mutations is by preventing infection. All right. So it sounds like the key is no infection and then no mutation, no sickness, no young people in hospital. The doctors are not going crazy. The nurses are not going crazy. Uh, so that's what we want to do. So that means what tools do we have? We only have three tools. We have a vaccine that will give you the goalie. So that way you can stop it if it comes into your body. We have a mask that will keep it out of your body. And then we have distance and ventilation. I put those two things together. So we only have three players. Uh, so let's use all three players at the same time. Um, so let's try to avoid where the governments are trying to say, if you get vaccinated, you can take away masks. <laughs> like it, like it, that part didn't make sense to me, right? And for children, they don't have a goalie for the moment. We will give them a goalie soon, but they don't have a goalie. So therefore, it makes sense to have the mask and distance. And uh, there was some questions about hands and things like that. Originally, we were thinking that your hands are going to be touching your face a lot. Now, because we all have masks on, the hands touching the face is much lower. So therefore, you don't have to scrub your hands until your skin falls off. Just every time you're going to go to your face, you should wash your hands before you touch your mask. Uh, but you don't need to keep scrubbing your hands every time you touch a doorknob. I was watching people doing this. So, so you don't have to do that. Um, it's probably not coming on your Amazon package or anything like that. That's what we were expecting in the beginning. It's a human being coming to you and then breathing on you and then you breathe it in. That's really how it's happening right now. And so therefore, I think um, I, I noticed that we're running out of time. So I would like to summarize just quickly is that I think that we've shown you that the vaccination works very well. It's a very good tool. And we maybe, you know, with the help of Simon, Mohit and Alan, you know, gave you some information and also some strategies to help uh, in terms of some people that might be sitting on the fence or maybe some people that are a little bit further away from the fence, that maybe we can help them move towards this. Um, and so therefore, if we can get everybody understanding the data, you know, with nice graphs and things like that, and all these companies working very hard to China make the next vaccine to make sure that the mutation isn't going to get us. Um, so therefore, they're working on that, working on making sure that their kids are safe with their vaccines as well. So we have that whole story. Our job is to help people understand that and also to make sure that they continue distance and mask for the moment, 
until we get rid of this. The good news is, as Alan was mentioning about SARS-1, SARS-1 disappeared, okay? So we actually got that fixed. The big difference, though, is SARS-1, when you get the virus, you look sick and you behave sick. And so therefore you ended up in hospital. So it infected people in the hospital, like your next person lying to you, but you didn't quite infect all the people in your family as badly. This one, you don't look very sick in the beginning. And that's a problem because I can produce virus and spew it out and be near you. And I look perfectly fine. And that's why this virus has taken over the world. So let's be safe. Okay. And, and for those that are, I, I know that there's a lot of people logged in that are professionals that are saying, how do I help my patients? Hopefully you're armed with information, correct information and up-to-date information. Thank you, Simon, Mohit, and Alan for bringing us up to date as of like probably this morning. Uh, and number two, uh, let's make sure that we don't get into conflict because our goal is the same. We, we don't want anybody to get sick. And so we just need to make sure that people use all the tools and we only have three players. That's it. We've got our vaccine, we've got our mask and we've got our distance and ventilation. We only have three players and we can't afford to say, you know, we're not gonna use one of the players. Um, and so let's try and use all the players we can. Uh, on that note, I want to thank you all. The, our panelists were fantastic. And on behalf of the audience, I want to thank uh, Simon, Mohit, Alan. Excellent discussion. Uh, very, very um, important information, but delivered in such a nice palatable way. I wish all of medical school was like this. I would have learned a whole lot more if it was like this in this fashion. So thank you guys very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for the Canadian Thoracic Society for allowing us to get together like this. And thank you to Moderna for, for giving the educational grant for this and also for their work in the, in the vaccine world because they were leaders there and, and they continue to be leaderships in that role. Um, so thank you all very much, everybody. Please stay safe. Please make sure that uh, good information gets out. Uh, make sure it's credible information that people are looking at. And let's make sure that we beat this virus because this thing can't move on its own. It can't, it has no wings or feet and it can't even make a copy of itself. So let's not help it along any further. Anyway, on that note, everybody take it easy and thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you at the next one coming up soon, shortly. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye.